From the north and the south we come. From east and west, God calls us. Over the mighty waters, the Lord speaks. I have called you by name. You are mine. Grateful for a God who calls us by name, claiming us and gathering us together. Let us call ourselves to worship this morning using the words printed in your bulletin. The Lord's voice is over the waters. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood waters. Let the Lord give strength to his people. Let the Lord bless his people with peace. Friends, I invite you now to stand as you are able and join together in singing our opening hymn of the morning. Hymn 356, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also Let us pray. Eternal God, in the waters of the Jordan River, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your Spirit. As Jesus heard you speak to him in his baptism, may we also hear you calling us your beloved children. May we who have been baptized in his name keep the covenant we have made and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior each day of our lives. May we, like our Savior, never turn away from the needs of this world, but reach out in love to all those we meet and find in need. In the name of your Son, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to greet those sitting around you with the peace of Christ.
morning. Welcome to Buford Presbyterian Church on this Baptism of the Lord Sunday. We are so glad to have you all here with us. I know it's cold and drizzly outside, but it's nice and warm in here, and we're grateful to have all of you gathered here with us this morning. Want to invite you, if you have not already, to go ahead and sign our Ritual of Friendship pads. Pass those down your pews and back. Gives us an opportunity to know that you're here today. And if you're sitting on a pew with somebody that you don't know, it gives you an opportunity to get to know their name as well. Want to invite you to read through your bulletin. There are a number of announcements for you. I'm going to call a few of those to your attention this morning. Just a word about this evening's schedule. We are sort of back to our regular schedule. Um, so we'll have bells tonight. We'll have um, both of our children's choirs as well as youth choir and then youth group this evening. So we invite everybody to come and be with us this evening. There is an announcement in your bulletin about um, some mission work that'll take place uh, uh, in Florida for those affected um, by Hurricane Michael. If you are interested in being a part of that, all of the details are there for you, but do be aware that the, the sign up is, uh, the deadline for sign up is coming up quickly, is January 25th. Um, so if you're interested in that, do take a look at that. It will be to help during the week uh, of February 15th through the 22nd. It is winter time, and because it's winter, we often are carrying um, a number of more things with us when we come into church. And as a result, there have been a lot more things being left here uh, when folks leave from church. So we just want to call your attention back in the back of the narthex um, on the right-hand corner where the hangers are. You'll see a number of um, jackets and coats and things that have been left, as well as there's a basket with, we've got car keys, we've got cell phones, we've got gloves. Glasses. We've got all sorts of stuff, um, and we want to get it back to its owners. We want it to find a home. So if you will take a look and see if any of those things belong to you, we are going to be donating them in the coming weeks um, because they've been here, some of them, for quite a while. Um, so either donating them or getting rid of them. So I just want to call your attention to that and invite you uh, to take a look if you are missing something. I am told that our second hymn is a little bit difficult to sing this morning. Um, so we are going to, Melissa is going to play um, our second hymn, which is hymn 390, O Savior in this Quiet Place. She's going to play uh, that for us. If you'd like to pull out your hymnal and kind of follow along, it'll get us prepared and ready for a little bit later in our worship service. But she's going to play the first verse of that. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite Tim Lamkuler forward. He's going to give us a stewardship update. Thank you, Carrie. I can't promise that I'm going to sing it to that tune, but uh, good morning and happy new year to everybody. It's certainly good to see so many faces here again this morning, despite the rain that we continue to receive. But as I said in the earlier service, it could be worse. My sister in St. Charles, Missouri texted me yesterday and said they had seven inches of snow as of yesterday. So I'm sure they've got more this morning. Uh, but this year, this time of year, as you probably know, is always very busy as we conclude one year and be, uh, prepare for what God has in store for us in the new year. And I do look forward to providing you an update on our 2018 budget results in a couple of weeks when we plan to present to you the final budget for this year. This morning, I'm here to simply provide one final update, no applause, on our stewardship results and to say thank you for your generous support of Buford Presbyterian Church. Our most recent pledge figures for this year are 133 pledges totaling $549,720. We are without a doubt grateful for every single pledge. The Finance Committee does still face the challenge of developing our 2019 budget with what is currently about $28,000 less in pledges than last year. However, we believe as we read in the books of Matthew and Mark that with God all things are possible and that God will provide according to our needs. It is also worth noting 
that while the number of pledges has decreased over the last four years, the average pledge amount has increased from a little more than $3,500 to $4,133.23 this year. Quite, quite a, a nice change, or quite a nice increase, and this is certainly evidence of a committed and faithful membership. The Finance Committee will meet again this Wednesday to finalize the 2019 budget before submitting it to session for approval. And if there are pledges yet to be submitted, we ask that they be received in the church office by the end of business Thursday, or Tuesday, I should say, in order to be included in the foundation for this year's budget. Pledges received after Tuesday are both encouraged and welcomed, and they will be applied towards the projected budget amount for unbudgeted new pledges. Pledge cards, should you need them, can be found either in the pews, on the table outside the church office, or in the office workroom where we keep the extra supply. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your continued support of Buford Presbyterian Church. And I look forward to the exciting journey ahead of us in 2019. Thank you, Tim. Friends, let us continue to worship God. When we pass through deep waters or go through fiery trials, the Lord our God is with us. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins together. Mighty and merciful God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we do not always live up to our calling. We have been timid and frightened disciples. Forget and the strength of your spirit among us. Forgive us as you have chosen us and claimed us in our baptism. Strengthen us anew to choose Christ's way in this world. Endow us with all the gifts of grace needed to fulfill our common calling through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do not fear, says the Lord, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God and amen. may be seated. This time I'd like to invite our children forward for our children's sermon this morning with Chris Baker. There's got to be more. <clears throat> I won't call names, I promise. <clears throat> Meredith Grief. Hey, come on down. Come on up. Come on down. Good morning, everybody. Where's your sisters? Well, I was thinking, come on up, Miller. I was thinking over the weekend, what am I going to talk about for children's sermon? And so I thought, well, this should be easy. I was thinking about last week's sermon from, from Pastor uh, Davis, and I thought, That'll be an easy one. That was so good, and it really resonated with me. And so it was all about light, and a lot of it was about the word glowworm. Do you guys know what glowworms are? Any idea what glowworms are? Not really. 
Well, Pastor Davis was saying one of his favorite toys when he was growing up, or one, one of the toys he liked during the holiday season, was, a, was something that gl glowed in the dark. You guys have any toys at the house that actually glow in the dark if you put them next to light and then turn the lights out, do they glow? Anybody ever had any toy like that? Well, he had some like that, so he would go outside and the way they would work is you would put them up maybe toward the sun and let them get shined on really brightly and then they, he would bring them into the house and they would glow. But they wouldn't last very long, they always needed extra light. I had some as a kid and they were like shaped in the size of maybe like a little animal or a dinosaur or something and I would always put them up next to a light bulb in the house. But don't do this because I left mine on the light bulb sometimes and they melted and I, I got in trouble for that. Yeah. No ideas, right? So um, that's really what it took to, to, to make those toys work and to illuminate like that. Well, we're all the same way. Think of you guys as being glowworms and you're glowing, right? And if you look out across the congregation, just imagine everybody right now glowing. Their heads are glowing, their bodies are glowing. That would look kind of funny, but in a way, that's really true because that's really what Jesus did for us when God sent him into the world. You know, he was known as the light of the world, right? And we get his light from him. Think about that. So what are some of the ways, if anybody has any ideas, of how we get our light from Jesus? What, what, are, the, what are some of the things we do or we can do to get that light so that we can shine brightly for others? Any ideas? The sun, yeah, we can go out in the sun because God created the sun, right? Yep, that's one. That's a great answer. Another way would be, how about prayer? We can say our prayers every night, right, before we go to bed. We're here in church, right, in Sunday school. So we get our light from that. Okay, one more. Wonderful. Read your Bible, right? That's a way to get all of your light from God. And a couple other things would be be nice to other people, right? You're your friends, your family, your people at school, always be nice and follow the rules from our parents and our grandparents, right? So great, yeah, so those are all the ways that we can be light to others and always shine brightly, but we have to continually do it just like that little toy that needs to go to the light, right, to, to illuminate, we're the same way. And that's the way God created us, to give him glory. So cool. Let's say a prayer and we'll wrap it up, okay? Everybody pray with me, dear God, Thank you for all the children in our church this morning and help us to be lights to others and follow Jesus' example to the glory of God. In his name we pray, amen. Okay, everybody, thank you. Have a good week. Let us pray. God of all creation, for the rain you send that nourishes the earth, for streams, rivers, and lakes that provide the water we need to sustain life, for the waters of baptism you offer that cleanse our hearts and our souls, we give you grateful thanks. For your voice that calls to us from the pages of scripture, reminding us that we are your people, your chosen ones, your beloved children. For your voice we hear in the call of the prophets, prophets of yesterday and today who convict us, point out when we have gone astray and show us the way back to you. For your voice, the small, still one we know in the quiet places of our hearts and lives, that acts as a guide and a compass, we give you grateful thanks. God of blessing, you drowned evil in the waters of the flood and promised a covenant of faithfulness with a rainbow in the sky. In the baptism of your son, you anointed him with the power of the Holy Spirit for the work that was ahead. 
In our baptism, you claimed us, sealing upon us our identity as a part of your covenant people. In the celebration of baptism, you remind us of our own baptisms, of the promises made on our behalf, and of the promises we have made, promises to love and to nurture, to support and walk with the children, youth, adults, and families of this congregation. Help us to continue to uplift each other in our journeys of faith. Keep before us always who and whose we are, O God. Keep us when we forget our baptismal vows. Hold us when we look for our identity in the wrong directions and cling to passing fads. Open us with your presence when our hearts are hardened and our minds are closed. Touch us with your spirit that we will once more know that you loved us long before we could love you. Trusting in your promises for the earth and all people, we bring our prayers before you this day. We pray for the world, for all the people of the world, that they might know that they are your beloved. We pray for those who suffer, that they will know your love. May we be bearers of comfort for them. We remember those this day who have gone before us, and we pray for those nearing death, that they may be at peace in your love for them. We pray for those who grieve. We pray for peace for them as well, that you might be a source of peace and comfort for them. We pray for your creation, O oh God, that it might stay healthy, continue to nourish and nurture us. And we pray for your church, that in the midst of diversity, we might find our unity in you. Hear us, O oh God, and hear our prayers, those that have been spoken and those that go unspoken this day. In one baptism with Christ and blessed by your Holy Spirit, we praise and give thanks to you and pray now in the name of your Son. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. I invite you to listen now for God's word speaking to us this day. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom. Ethiopia and Saba I give in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my sight and honored and I love you, I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west, I will gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I invite you to stand and sing hymn number 390, O Savior in this quiet place.
Please be seated. Our second scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 3 verses 15 through 22. This is baptism of the Lord Sunday and as Carrie was saying earlier this week when we were talking, um, this story shows up in all four gospels and you know that when a story shows up in all four gospels that it's certainly an important story to the church. Um, this one in particular comes from Luke. It's Luke's version, chapter 3, verses 15 through 22. So listen for this witness to the baptism of our Lord. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, that is John the Baptist, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I'm not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things Herod had done, added to them all by shutting John up in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Here's a confession. When John the Baptist says that Jesus will baptize with Holy Spirit and fire, I have never really known what he meant. Partly because it seems that Jesus and his disciples did have a baptism ministry like John's and it seems they did use water. But this promise that Jesus would baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire is part of John's witness to who the Messiah would be. So there must be something to it. But I've never really understood what John had in mind with that line. I mean, I've done a few baptisms before. We always use water. Water's a great choice. You can put your hand in it. You can lift it up. You can't hold it tight, but you can hold enough of it to sprinkle some on top of someone's head if you're Presbyterian. But the Holy Spirit? Sure, the Spirit is always with us, but you can't manipulate it like you can good old H2O, what does it look like then for Jesus to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire? Now fire, I guess you can control a little bit better, but no pastor is going to put their hand in it. And if you think babies cry when you sprinkle some cold water on their heads, <laughs> forget it. Needless to say, if Jesus is baptizing with fire, then how is this baptism desirable? John may think he's talking Jesus up and making Jesus sound more powerful than himself, but I think most of his audience would be just fine with a plain old water baptism as opposed to spirit and fire. But, according to John, the Messiah has come to baptize with Holy Spirit and fire. You know, actually, the Greek word for spirit and the Hebrew word for that matter can really have sort of multiple meanings. Pneuma is the word for spirit. It's that root word for pneumonia uh, when we talk about a disease in our lungs. And it can have the meaning also for breath or wind. So maybe it's the threshing floor metaphor that John talks about that can really tell us what it means to be baptized by spirit or wind or breath 
and fire because in John's metaphor about the threshing floor and the winnowing fork, we will find all three at work. Jesus, wind, and fire. Now the goal of winnowing here is to get wheat berries, good, clean, usable grains of wheat, separate from the chaff, the other grassy, husky parts of the wheat plant. Actually, the goal is to make food, right? To make bread. But first, we have to get the grain separated from all the other junk, the stalk and the husks around the grain, the chaff. So what they do is they cut off the heads of the stalk and sift the wheat a couple of times to get the largest pieces of trash away from the grain but it's impossible to get all of the chaff off just by sifting. So finally the wheat is winnowed. And winnowing is literally throwing the wheat in the air or dropping the wheat through the air. And because the grain is heavier than the chaff, it allows the wind to blow away all the junk that has clung to the grain up to this point. The wind blows it away. And then Jesus takes the junk and burns it in the fire. And the grain becomes what it was always meant to become. It becomes bread, sustenance, life-giving food. The other day, I watched a video of a modern-day winnowing, and it was really cool to see the guy who was working with the wheat had gotten it down to grain as much as he could, sifting out most of the grassy pieces. Then he would take a bucket of wheat and pour it from about six feet up from the ground in front of a plain old plastic box fan down into another bin that was on the ground. And it was so cool, they played the video in slow motion and you could see all of this light, almost dust-like stuff being blown off and away from the grain while the grain fell straight down into the bin. And then he did it again. And then he said he would let it dry for a few more days and then do it again, determined to get the grain as free from debris as possible. This is what I actually think John envisions in his metaphor, the baptism of Holy Spirit and fire, Jesus diligently working to utterly separate people from their trash, their junk, their chaff. <clears throat> the wind of the Holy Spirit will blow it away and then Jesus will burn it away so that you will have nothing holding you back from becoming the thing you were meant to be. Something that brings goodness and life into the world. Something like bread. This is the work of Jesus' baptism. To deal once and for all with the chaff. With all of that stuff that is so empty in reality that the wind could just blow it away. But even so, it still has the power to keep us from being bread. We see this all over the place in Jesus' ministry. With the sick and possessed, he blows away their ailments. With the sinners and outcasts, he blows away their stigmas. With his opponents, he blows away their self-righteousness. With the cross, he blows away sin. And with the empty tomb, he even blows away death. In the presence of Christ, nothing is allowed to stay stuck to you that would keep you from being the bread you were created to be. Jesus, wind, and fire, says John the Baptist. That's what's coming. The ministry of Christ will be making kingdom bread. And he has to prepare the grains to do it. This sounds like Nothing but good news to me. And yet, it's the strangest thing that sometimes, actually a lot of times, Jesus finds that we grains want to hold on to our husks. You know what I mean? You know, we love 
what's familiar, even if it's not good, it's been part of us for a while. We're used to it. Not because it's good for us, but because it's familiar and we're used to it. And that husk feels like safety sometimes even. It's always been there with us since we started to grow, and it seems like it must be a good thing. But as long as we cling to it, it won't let us be bred. Those husks have to go. This is true for us as individuals, and it's true for churches as well. There are probably some things clinging to this church that Jesus would love to winnow out. I haven't been here long enough to tell you what they are, but every church has them. Chaff that keeps us from being as hospitable as Christ would have us be. Husks that keep us from being as faithful as Christ would have us be. Old withered grasses that keep us from giving as much grace as Christ would have us give. I don't know what these things are, but I bet you might. Jesus has come that we might be bred for a starving world, but the spirit and fire have to do their work on us. Throw us in the air, blow through our grains, and burn off the husks, Jesus, wind, and fire. Of course, Jesus has his own baptism, and people always ask, why did Jesus have to be baptized? If Jesus was sinless and John was baptizing for the repentance of sin, then why did Jesus have to be baptized? And I think that question starts off on the wrong premise. Jesus didn't have to be baptized. He wanted to be baptized. Because just as we say that he is the one with the winnowing fork, he is also, by some mystery of faith, a grain of wheat on the threshing floor with us. Showing us how it's done. Jesus wants to be baptized. In other gospels, he actually has to convince John to do it. He wants to be in solidarity with us. Jesus isn't one to stand off to the side and tell us from a distance we have to change. He's right down in there, right down in here with us. If we're in the water, then he's in the water. If we're in the mud, then he's in the mud. If we're in the grave, he's been there too. Even if we're going through hell, according to the Apostles' Creed, he's been there too. Jesus comes to change us. And that can be hard and uncomfortable, and we don't want it. But Jesus is also always there with us. So that when we need strength, he's never far off. Jesus didn't have to be baptized like us. He wants to be baptized with us. So finally, it is the work of Jesus and the Spirit and the fire not to hurt us or to scare us or to burn us, but to change us, to give us freedom from sin and all the junk that clings to us. Jesus simply wants us to be who we were meant to be. The grain was meant to be bread. We are meant to be sustenance in our own ways, as individuals and as a church, for a world hungry for true bread. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Now, having heard the word read and proclaimed, let us stand as the church and recite the faith of the church using the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. Please stand with me. And we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, 
and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And so it is a great privilege to the church and to her members that we have been called to be partners in ministry with Christ through the ways that we are bred ourselves for others and through the ways that we offer what we have to the church. So let us give our tithes and offerings joyfully, knowing that we are partners with Christ's mission to the world.
pray. Gracious God, we dedicate these gifts to the work of your Son in this world, to the work of winnowing and bringing about new life for people who need new life. We dedicate these gifts to the work of your church to bring about spiritual and physical help to those in need. And we pray that in all that we do, in our partnership with you, that we might also one day hear the voice that Christ heard, that we are your beloved children, the beloved, and in us you are well pleased. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn is hymn number 131, When It Makes All Winds to Blow. This is a Pentecost hymn, so you'll hear some Pentecost themes in there, but it talks so much about uh, the Holy Spirit as in terms of the way we've talked about it here today. So, Wind Who Makes All Winds That Blow. be visiting with us and searching for a new church home, we invite you to find a home here with us as we seek to be God's faithful people in this community. And for those of you who are members here of this church, maybe even longtime members, I invite you to imagine that you are still being winnowed. And like that farmer I talked about who winnowed his seed once, twice, came back days later and did it again, that Christ is still winnowing us and changing us and making us more and more into the people that we were meant to be. And so I invite you to believe that. And if you would like to discuss what that feels like or looks like in your life, I invite you to have that conversation either with me or with Pastor Kerry or better yet with another church member. And you can talk together about what God is doing 
in your lives. In any case, as you go out into the world, go carrying the love of Christ to everyone you meet by word and by deed. And as you go, go with the grace, love, peace, and fellowship of the one holy triune God, now and forevermore. Amen.